Welcome back to the home of hard science. And today I'm going to pivot into geopolitics and history because oftentimes that's more important than many aspects of science in today's world. So this is one, a 40 minute talk uh, with all the historical context from the 50s right through to today. And it's absolutely fascinating. And I genuinely believe that without internalizing uh, the content of a talk like this, you really can't have the proper context for what's been happening in the last few years and what will happen in the coming years. So really important history to understand. I found it highly enjoyable and I've shared it widely elsewhere. And now I'm going to share it here for you. So sit back, relax and enjoy getting educated in some of the most important stuff uh, you can ever actually learn. Here we go. Much honored to introduce the Dr. Jacob Nordengord, and you will hold a presentation on the not-so-hidden conspiracy of the World Economic Forum. It's an open conspiracy, you could say. The conspiracy is out in the open. My name is Jacob Nordengord, and I'm going to do a presentation now called The Shapers of the Future. And this will cover the origin, history, and uh, how the World Economic Forum has become the major vehicle for a technocratic reshaping of humanity and the planet. I have a PhD in science and technology studies from Linköping University. Uh, I'm a geographer, culture and media pro producer, and I'm also the founder of the Faros Foundation. And uh, we work to highlight threats to democracy, freedom of thought, as well as against humanity itself. I'm also the CEO of publishing company Forest Media Productions. I've uh, written five books about the global agenda and uh, power play. My doctor thesis, the first one, Order of Ab Cow, it's called was about the European Union energy politics and the goal to create a sustainable energy system less dependent on fossil fuels. It was out in 2012 and it's very topical now. I have also written a book about the Rockefeller philanthropies and their involvement in the climate issue. And my latest book, The Global Coup d'etat, the Globala Statskupen in Swedish, covers the background to the pandemic and how it became a trigger to implement a technocratic world order. This is a quote from the political scientist Samuel Huntington. The divorce class have little need for national loyalty view national boundaries as obstacles that are thankfully vanishing and see national governments as residues from the past whose only useful function is to facilitate the elite's global operations. Huntington knew what he was talking about. Himself a professor from the Harvard University a hotbed for the creation of World Economic Forum. Hunt Huntington, he was an uh, insider, very involved with power politics, origins and history. In 1956, Special Studies Project was initiated by Nelson Rockefeller at the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Uh, it was an ambitious project that addressed the problems of its day and how to solve them. Nelson, he had uh, presidential ambitions. He had put together a brain trust to bring his aspirations to life. The young academian Henry Kissinger from Harvard was handpicked to uh, serve as the project's manager. Henry. He had previously been involved in a study group on nuclear weapons at the influential think tank Council on Foreign Relations, together with uh, David Rockefeller. 
Nelson's brother. David, he was a banker at the Chase Manhattan Bank and a director at the council since 1949. The Council on Foreign Relations was dominated by the Rockefellers at this time and promoted their business-oriented form of internationalism. Henry Kissinger, he became a loyal partner to these Rockefeller interests and has served them ever since. The stated objective with, uh, with this special studies project was to shape a new world order in all its dimensions. Spiritual, economic, political, social. The challenge was, quote, to build a new structure that will make possible the fulfillment of the basic purposes of humanity. To achieve their goal, they identified science and technology as the key to further their internationalist course. No other area required more uh, cooperation than science. And it identified global health and climate change. This is as early as in the 50s. Especially interesting as these problems span across the borders of the globe. The panel that came up with this proposal was shared by Milton Katz from Harvard Law School with David Rockefeller as a member. No, the Rockefellers and climate change, the oil men and climate change is an interesting combination. The Rockefellers, they had already been instrumental in establishing the United Nations as illustrated by this picture from their website of the Rockefeller Capital Management. You can see all these achievements that are more Rockefeller organizations. But in the middle, we have United Nations that they view as their own little club or organization. Henry Kissinger, and he was also the director of Harvard's International Seminar and started the Center for International Relations in 1958. This seminar had the purpose to establish better understanding among a select group of people who will be in top leadership roles in their countries in the years ahead. The seminar was funded by the Ford and Rockefeller Foundation and as later revealed the CIA. David Rockefeller himself he was on the board of the overseers of Harvard and the president between 1966 and 1968. One leader of the future what, that came under Kissinger's influence was Klaus Schwab, a young economist from Ravensburg in Germany that had come to USA to gain a Master of Public Administration at Harvard. He was the right man for a new mission to further the internationalist agenda and shape a global business institution. This is a clip with Klaus talking to his mentor 50 years later. Dr. Kissinger, our time, uh, our satellite time is running out. What wonderful opportunity to conclude our week here with such uh, concrete proposals and ideas of how we can really create, I would say, a new world order. And um, I feel uh, we should be very grateful to you, Henry, for taking the time at a very important uh, day in the United States to be at least uh, digitally with us and on behalf of all those sitting here in the room I would like to thank you very much. I would like to thank you personally also for the 50 year long mentorship and uh, all the advice you have given me. Thank you and we appreciate it very much. Please join me. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> That was uh, Klaus talking to his master, <laughs> Kissinger. And uh, 
Kissinger of, of course has his masters. In 1970, uh, Klaus Schwab founded the European Management Forum in Switzerland in order to arrange meetings and allow top managers of corporations to interact with all their stakeholders. That means shareholders, suppliers, governments and civil society. This forum would also spread new management techniques to the Europeans. To the inaugural meeting, Klaus had invited two academians involved with Harvard's international seminar, Kenneth Galbraith and Hermann Kahn. Other notable guests were Otto von Habsburg from the Pan-European Union. Anybody know about the Pan-European Union? And also Dame Barbara Ward from Columbia University in New York. The latter was a British economist that became an early promoter of sustainable development. This was to become an integral part of the forum's agenda. Barbara wrote the book Only One Earth. The care and maintenance of a small planet as a framework for the United Nations Conference on the Environment in Stockholm in 1972. She also worked together with the Secretary General for the conference, Maurice Strong, to convince the developing nations to go along with the agenda. They were both members of the environmental think tank Club of Rome and closely associated with the Rockefeller interests. Strong was mentoring Klaus Schwab and was for many years a member of the forum's board. At the meeting in 1973, the president of the Club of Rome, Aurelio Pecce, was invited to talk about their report Limits to Growth and the World Problematic. Due to stress with a rising population and unsustainable use of resources, it was concluded that the planet was in need of a global management to take care of the planet. The Club of Rome had been started with a grant from Pecce's boss from Fiat. Giovanni Anelli, a close business associate and friend of David Rockefeller. At the same meeting, the divorce manifesto was drafted. It stated among others that the management has to serve society. It must assume the role of a trustee of a material universe for future generation. It has to use the immaterial and material resources at its disposal in an optimal way. It has to continuously expand the frontiers of knowledge in management and technology. The forum decided that the elites of the world would take the roles as stewards of the planet. This meeting was sponsored by the European communities and Prince Bernard of the Netherlands. Anybody know about Prince Bernard? He was uh, the founder of the Bilderberg, Bilderberg Group. In October 1973, the Arab countries started an oil embargo towards nations that had supported Israel during the Yom Kippur War. That meant that the price of oil increased with 300%. The oil crisis was a fact. This gave support to the warnings from the Club of Rome about resource scarcity. Later, the Saudi Arabian Minister of Petroleum, Sheikh Ahmed Zaki Yamani, stated this that uh, Henry Kissinger had been involved and used some of his diplomatic skills to kind of incite this embargo. An eventual rise in the price had also been discussed at the Bilderberg Conference in Saltsjöbaden, Sweden, in May 1973. Hmm, foresight. They had a problem that needed to be solved. 
To further the aspirations for a global management of the planet, the elite think tank Trilateral Commission was founded by David Rockefeller in 1973. They called for a new international economic order to better manage the world. The member, US Ambassador Richard Gardner, wrote an article in the Council on Foreign Relations magazine Foreign Affairs that explained the plan as an end run around national sovereignty, eroding it piece by piece, will accomplish much more than the old-fashioned frontal assault. Gardner had been a consultant to the Rockefeller Special Studies project. What we had in mind was a new system that was technocratic, a society built and run by scientists and engineers. A high-tech society managed like a big corporation. Technocracy Incorporated that had started as a project at the Rockefeller Associated Columbia University in the 1930s had developed these ideas. As Paragana, a World Economic Forum disciple recently stated, if you want a better world for your children, don't hold your breath for global democratic deliberation. The worse climate scenarios get, the more decision makers will be forced into radical top-down measures overseen by technocrats, not activists. And here we see Anthony Fauci, of course. In 1975, World Future Society arranged the conference Crisis and Opportunity the next 25 years. The vice president, but he was at the time, Nelson Rockefeller gave an opening address. They discussed the possibilities of creating a new technocratic world civilization and how to achieve this. The futurist Warren Wager had his prescription. There is no better time to implement radical changes than after a worldwide catastrophe. It was World Club of Rome's mission to warn about such events, shaping the future agenda. In 1987, the forum changed its name to the World Economic Forum. The new agenda that was come after the Cold War was discussed. Here we see Maurice Strong with science writer Joël de Rosnay. Strong, that had served as head of the United Nations Environmental Programme, talked about sustainable development and global warming. Or the warm war, you could say. Whereas Rosne, special advisor to Prime Minister of Mauritius, is known for the concept Symbiont, a planetary superorganism or brain comprising of humans, nations, machines, ecosystems and networks. A cybernetic organism that the World Economic Forum wanted to bring to life. Strong was part of the United Nations Brundtland Commission together with Norwegian Prime Minister Gro Harlem Brundtland. Both were members of the Trilateral Commission. Their report, Our Common Future, defined the concept of sustainable development. The inclusion of climate change in the report was initiated and funded by the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. I cover this in my book about the Rockefellers. The report was a part of the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro that was headed by Strong. The conference decided to implement the Agenda for the 21st Century, Agenda 21, and start the United Nations Climate Convention. The motto for the conference was in our hands. Whose hands? I think you know the answer. This is some of the guys and girls. After this uh, big environmental meeting, they wanted to start uh, and develop a new ethical framework for the planet. The Earth Charter Commission was born. Queen Beatrix of Netherlands that is the daughter of uh, Prince Bernard, and her Prime Minister Rud Lubbers 
asked Morris Strong and the former leader of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, to chair the commission. The West and the East was bonded together. Nelson Rockefeller's son Stephen became the project's coordinator. And it's very interesting to, to note that Royal Dutch Shell, you know, the Royals in the Netherlands, they have a lot of shares in Royal Dutch Shell, of course, and the Rockefellers with Exxon. These are the guys and girls that want to create our sustainable future. Stephen also gave seed money to the Global Scenario Group in order to create scenarios for how a planetary civilization could be created. This was led by Paul Raskins from the Earth Charter Commission and a member of the Club of Rome. In 2002 they released the book The Great Transition. The cover with a globe in pieces that are put together describes what it was all about. Build back better. They assumed that a general crisis for the needed transformation could be triggered by an unprecedented pandemic. The end goal was to achieve a world union with a world court and a world regulatory authority. Klaus had already started to educate leaders for transformation. This is in Klaus Schwab's own words. And I have to say, um, when I mention our names like Mrs. Merkel, um, even uh, Vladimir Putin and so on, they all have been young global leaders of the World Economic Forum. Mm -hmm. But um, what we are very proud of now is the young generation like uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, um, President of, Brez of uh, Argentina and so on, that we penetrate the cabinets. So yesterday I was at a, at a reception for Prime Minister Trudeau and I know that half of this cabinet or even more half of, uh, half of this cabinet are for our actually young global leaders of the world economy right. form. In uh, 1992, Schwab and the World Economic Forum had started the program Global Leaders of Tomorrow with leaders like Angela Merkel, Nicolas Sarkozy, José Manuel Barroso for European Union, Gordon Brown and Tony Blair. In 2004, this program was morphed into a more ambitious five-year program called Young Global Leaders. More than 4,000 leaders have been involved with these programs. Here are some examples. Sanna Marin from Finland, Emmanuel Macron, France, New Zealand's Prime Minister Shinda Arden, Leonardo DiCaprio, Alicia Garza from Black Lives Matters, and Sebastian Kurz, Chancellor of Austria. We, my foundation, Forest Foundation, has in, in uh, cooperation with the Malone Institute compile a list of all these leaders and all their occupations, what we are doing and what we are doing now. Uh, and it can be downloaded from the Malone Institute's webpage. They are everywhere, we can tell. And here, of course, the dynamic duo, Bill Gates and Justin Trudeau, happy, smiling. <laughs> they all talked with one voice. In uh, 2005, the Young Global Leaders started the 2020 initiative to use scenario and visioning exercises to understand current and future trends, risks and opportunities. Formulate a shared vision of the world in 2020 and create task forces to advance their vision. This was later renamed the 2030 initiative. In 2006, World Economic Forum released their first global risks report. It stated that the risk of a pandemic flu was a dominant theme in the global conversation on risk and that misinformation and infodemics could lead to a breakdown of trust. Both had to be countered. 
The same year saw the release of a military think tank RAND Corporation's report, Global Technological Revolution 2020. It predicted that RFID ships would be used to track products and people by 2020. Big changes was on the horizon. Management of the commons. In 2008, the global financial crisis hit the world. This became a trigger to reshape the system. Uh, in the middle of a crisis, World Economic Forum held its first summit on the global agenda in Dubai. The goal was to redesign the international system according to the needs of the 21st century. The world was, according to Schwab, in need of a fundamental reboot. It gave birth to a global brain trust. What have we heard this word before? The brain trust. Rockefeller Special Studies project going global. The World Economic Forum's more than 70 global agenda council with 1,500 thought leaders and experts, think tanks that would shape the agenda for the coming years. One of those were the Global Agenda Council on Pandemics. The annual meeting in 2009 was titled Shaping the Post-Crisis World and gave birth to the Global Redesign Initiative consisting of a newly founded Global Agenda Councils. The Global Agenda Council on the Future of Governments concluded in their reports that the current order had four governance gaps. Lack of trust, lack of incentives, lack of institutions and a lack of time. The governments were in danger of being irrelevant and a new approach was needed. The solution was a digital Marshall Plan with e-governments to engage the citizens. It stated that this would help develop better warning systems for disaster and crisis prevention and for preventing problems in the global economy. It would enable new forms of global cooperation and governance. No one should be left behind. Henry Kissinger wrote in New York Times that the ultimate challenge is to shape the common concern of most countries regarding the economic crisis together with a common fear of jihadist terrorism into a common strategy reinforced by the realization that new issues like proliferation, energy and climate change permit no national or regional solution. Due to the crisis, G20 consisting of the world's 20 biggest economies, including Russia and China and the European Union, became the premier political forum to discuss and manage global problems. As the president of the European Council, Hermann von Rompuy, said, 2009 is also the first year of global governance with the establishment of a G20 in the middle of a financial crisis. World Economic Forum was closely aligned Several of the, of the leaders had been part of Kla Schwab's Young Global Leaders Scheme. G20 took over the position from the G7, G8 and is working to establish a new international economic order. They gather all central actors that shape the global agenda like United Nations, the World Bank and the OECD. And you have probably seen this. In 2010, Rockefeller Foundation released the report Scenarios for the Future and International de Development. It contained scenarios that discussed how the technological development could be furthered or hindered in the future. Lockstep discussed the possibility of a severe pandemic, hack attack, cyber warfare and resource shortages and clever together a united world that worked together to solve global problems i will get back to his scenarios the year after world economic forum started the grassroots initiative grassroots world economic forum mm. Uh, this uh, global shapers community consisted of consisted of people under the age of 30 
it has since grown to 479 hubs all over the world with over 14,000 members. The mission is to empower young people to play an active role in shaping local, regional and global agendas. This young grassroots are led by Klaus Schwab and have to be endorsed by an existing shaper or another member of the World Economic Forum community. In 2015, World Economic Forum transformed into an international organization for public-private partnership and was ready for a new, more active role in shaping the future. The time had come for the Great Transformation. In 2015, United Nations Agenda 2030 with 17 global goals was decided. Schwab and the Forum was well prepared. At the annual meeting in 2016, Klaus Schwab declared the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Very satisfied. This is a plan to totally reshape the planet and humanity with digital technology, artificial intelligence, robots, neurotechnological brain enhancements, and surveillance from space. What a plan! I hear no applause. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why. Klaus seems very confident in this. Uh, the forum was well prepared with its many working groups and communities, all intended to shape the future they wanted. The forum's shapers consist of the leading companies of the world. They engage in the forum's platforms. This is some of them that has paid the most to be on board and shape the global agenda. You can see some interesting companies and uh, also foundations like Bill Gates and Welcome Trust and uh, Big Tech, of course, very involved. And Centers for the Fourth Industrial Revolution has since this started all over the globe. This is from the web page of the Russian Federation. Their centers started as late as October last year. World Economic Forum's Board of Trustees consists of the most powerful interests of the world, especially the world of banking. Bank of England, Bank of America, European Central Bank, IMF, World Bank Group, Bank of China, Bank of International Settlements, and uh, as late as uh, 2019, the Russian Sberbank. These are the trustees of a material universe for future generations. This is just some names. Ulsa von der Leyen was in the World Economic Forum's Board of Trustees in 2019, before she became loyal to the agenda in, as a European uh, head of the Commission. Here we also find Larry Fink from BlackRock and David Rubenstein from Carlyle Group. These both men are members of the Council on Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission. Rubenstein, he also sits on the board of the Harvard Corporation. The connections are still tight with the university where the ideas for the forum was initiated. In June 2019, the Forum signed a formal partnership with the United Nations. Nobody talked about this in the news. Uh, no newspaper, no television, no radio, nobody said nothing about this. This has become a powerful alliance to execute the agenda. The cooperation had, however, been going on for a couple of years. The United Nations Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed has, for example, been on the board of a young global leader since 2017. 
The forum committed itself to finance Agenda 2030 and work with areas like climate change, health, digital cooperation, gender and education. <laughs> The global goals would all be solved for the use of disruptive technologies of the fourth industrial revolution. The same year, G20 in Japan introduced the Society 5.0 concept connecting the United Nations Agenda 2030 with the World Economic Forum's fourth industrial revolution. United Nations, World Economic Forum and G20 forms the Troika of global governance. This is the top-down management of the planet, the managers, executing the future agenda. In September 2019, United Nations initiated the Decade of Action. The plan was about to be implemented. Climate activist Greta Thunberg arrived to New York with a sailing boat Malizia to give a speech at the Climate Action Summit. Malizia. Do you know what it means? Mm? Why do you choose that boat with a name Malizia? This trip was sponsored by Albert, Prince Albert from Monaco, a member of the World Economic Forum. It was a race the billionaires of the world had to win. The motto, Unite Behind the Science, was an echo of a statement from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund's Special Studies Project 60 years earlier. And that was also when they decided that climate change was something that would, could be very useful. At the same meeting, the Club of Rome declared a planetary emergency facing climate, biodiversity and health. This was eerily similar to the scenario of Fortress World from the Great Transition Initiative from 2002. The forces of global order take action. International, military, corporate and governance bodies supported by the most powerful national governments form the self-styled Alliance for Global Salvation. Using a revamped United Nations as their platform, a state of planetary emergency is declared. The Alliance would then implement draconian measures. In 2002, we said this. The scenarios tell a lot about the future agenda. Less than a month later, the exercise event 2-1 was held by Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security in cooperation with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and World Economic Forum. It was stated that a severe pandemic which becomes event 201 would require reliable cooperation among several industries, national governments and key international institutions. They needed to prepare for the event that would become a pandemic. It was prophetic words on March 11, 2020, Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus from WHO declared a global health emergency. It started a chain reaction that closely resembled Rockefeller Foundation's lockstep scenario from 2010. A world with tighter down government control with citizens willingly surrender their freedoms. Three months later, Klaus Schwab declared that the world was in need of a great reset. Now is a historical moment, a time, not only to fight severe virus, but to shape the system. It was echoed by United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres. The Great Reset is a welcome recognition that this human tragedy must be a wake-up call. It is imperative that we reimagine, rebuild, redesign, reinvigorate and rebalance our world. Rebalancing investment, harnessing science and technology and advancing the transition to net zero emissions, all elements of the Great Reset are fundamental to building the future we need. The future you need, <clears throat> not my future. The World Economic Forum and United Nations had their prescription ready. The working group shaping the future of health had been in preparation since 2016. Here are some examples of their kind of solutions. Artificial organ bioengineering, gene editing, preventive medicine and precision medicine. Do you like that? No? 
The working group was also deeply involved in the immunization agenda to co-create the future of vaccines. The Commons project was started by young global leader Paul Meyer and Rockefeller Foundation in 2019 to unlock the full, full potential of technology and data for the common good. We have seen and paid for the consequences. And now WHO plan to build an even more efficient system to manage future pandemics and tackle misinformation. It is planned for implementation in 2024. The new global health architecture is one of the main goals for G20 this year. The others are digital transformation and a sustainable energy transition. As the Club of Rome wrote in 2020, if we don't change the system, more planetary crises and future shocks are coming that will eventually exceed the capacities of governments. This next planetary crisis arrived in late February with the war in Ukraine. Now the new energy crisis has arrived and a food crisis looming. This resembles the hack attack scenario from the Rockefeller Foundation playbook that describes proxy wars, global food and resource shortages, as well as cyber attacks. As Klaus Schwab said last year, in order to shape the future, you have to control the narrative. 2020 is a year that has really changed the world. It is thanks to technology that we are able to join the cyber polygon entirely remotely. This training is another step in creating a trusted digital environment and fostering open dialogue to discuss even the most challenging cybersecurity issues. Nobody can fight these phenomena which are only going to increase in the next couple of years, this dynamic technological environment. this world grows in, in force and, and this happens throughout the world it's just a statement of the obvious you need to protect people properly it is a very close cooperation between the enemies this is Klaus Schwab. Dear Hermann Graf, Your Excellency, Prime Minister Mikhail Mishustin, dear participants, it's such a privilege to address you all at a time when we so much rely on digital infrastructure and of course it's underpinning cybersecurity. I wish to thank in particular my good friend and committed partner at the World Economic Forum, Mr. Hermann Greff, the CEO and Chairman of the Executive Board at Sparebank, and of course also a member of the Board of Trustees of the World Economic Forum. The Forum has built an excellent relationship with the Russian Federation, both with the business community as well as with the government. I was pleased to meet with President Putin last year and I look forward to deepening this relationship with you, Mr. Prime Minister, and your government. The relation uh, has been very close. Vladimir Putin and Henry Kissinger has had quite long warm relations, according to Russian news agency TASS. World Economic Forum has already prepared a new meal, a food system transition that will change what we eat. Synthetic food, insects, and a digitized food system. The energy system is also set to transform, to shape a global smart grid and to create the internet of everything where things and people are connected into one global net with data to be shared, monitored and controlled just like the RAND report predicted in 2006. This comes with digital identities to rule us all. The ID2020 Alliance was created in 2017 by Rockefeller Foundation, Gavi Vax the Vaccine Alliance and Microsoft. This will introduce a system with carbon credits, with allowances on how much or what we can purchase and eat without risking the planetary health. Do you think Henry Kissinger will have a card like this? Central bank digital currency is now being introduced. This is also a major theme for the G20. 
It gives central control over every transaction. A social credit system is in line to be introduced in order to rate and influence our behavior. And on top of it all, a digital god that acts as judge and overseer. A cybernetic world organism. Joel de Rosne called it the macroscope, a tool to study, predict and direct human activity. It also goes back to the science fiction writer H.G. Wells' vision of the world brain as well as Oliver Rice's The World Sensorium. All for the care and maintenance of a small planet that Barbara Ward called for in 1972. And now the last slides. The future of the global commons. Last year, Antonio Guterres released our common agenda with 12 future commitments that will bring the new multilateral system to life. It follows the scenario clever together from the Rockefeller report. Centralized global oversight and governance structures sprang up, not just for energy use, but also for disease and technology standards. Nation states lost some of their power and importance as global architecture strengthened and regional governance structures emerged. International oversight entities like the UN took on new levels of authority. In March 18 this year, the former Swedish Prime Minister Stefan Löfven was chosen as co-shared to the high-level advisory board on effective multilateralism, but works to further this agenda. Nice choice. David Rockefeller said in 1991, it would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world if we had been subjected to the lights of publicity during those years. But the world is now more sophisticated and prepared to march towards a world government. The supranational sovereignty of an intellectual elite and world bankers is surely preferable to the national autodetermination practiced in past centuries. This is a very old dream coming true. The New Atlantis by Francis Bacon about the scientists ruling the world. But in, in this version with the bankers at the top. But the future isn't written in stone and now these plans are out in the light. I say it is time that we as humans come together and say no to these transhuman fantasies and scientific management of the planet and shape the future we want as humans. Thank you. I hope you found that as illuminating as I did. It filled in a lot of gaps in my historical knowledge. I'm a World War II buff and I'm quite interested in history, but I really uh, didn't have a full grasp of a lot of that content there going way back. So as always, huge thanks for my Patreon and PayPal supporters and anyone else who can jump on board and support a little, really appreciate that because we need to analyze what's going on in the world of science, in the world of geopolitics, in the world of malign influence by corporations, which at this stage has gotten so out of hand, uh, we've lost the legacy media essentially. So very important, we ideally keep supporting uh, anyone who can get the message, the data and the clarity out there and counter the corporate misinformation and disinformation. So thanks so much, folks.